Okay, we're ready to get started in our class tonight. Appreciate your being here. We're still in Hebrews chapter 11, or 12 rather. <laughs> but anyhow, we've got, we've got several things we need to talk about here. I, I don't know how many of you know, uh, the elders have been very gracious to me in allowing me to work at home uh, through the week so I can be there to help take care of Donna. And uh, I come up here early on Wednesdays to run off my notes and Saturday nights late to come up here to run off the notes for my Sunday morning class. And what I didn't know was they bought a new printer. And it took me for a while to get, get on my program to get to that. And I printed it off and it printed two pages and it jammed. And when I went back there, I didn't recognize the printer, and there were just a picture of the printer on the screen there and lines going every which way, and it says press to see where it's jammed at. And I did, and it was jammed in every place that it can jam at. <laughs> so it took me a while to get those off, and I got those off and went to print it again, and it did the same thing. So I was looking for J.J. and couldn't find him. He was one that knew how to, to handle it. When J.J. came in, he, he didn't believe me. He said, that's a brand new printer. He said, he, he said I've been using it all day yesterday and, and just running things off. No problem. I said, well, it is. So he went in there and got it unjammed and tried it again. It did the same thing. So I'm here without notes tonight. Somebody told me, so, well, you can do it without notes. And I said, well, 40 years ago I could have. But you know, one of the things we talked about here is about getting old uh, is the mind starting to fail. Can't remember things the way you used to. Uh, so it's going to be a fun experience tonight. But the joke's going to be on y'all. <laughs> so, but we'll look at this now. We're, we're here in, in chapter 12, as I said. Uh, and we're going to begin uh, at, at verse 5. Uh, and we've already talked about some of this, but verse 5 says, and this again is talking about the aging process in people. And he says, They are afraid also of what is high, and terrors are in the way, the almond tree blossoms, all of those we've talked about last time. Then it begins, The grasshopper dry, drags itself along, and desire fails, because man goes to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the street. So, Three things here to talk about the aging process, and then he's going to get into talking about death. Uh, and so as we look at these things, first of all, it says the grasshopper drags itself along. Now, I know there are different translations. Someone have something different from that? This is a Revised Standard Version, and it says the grasshopper drags itself along. All right, the grasshopper shall be a burden. Uh, so the idea, if you look at it from that translation... What it may be talking about is that as you get older, uh, you start losing your strength. You can't do the things that you used to do. And we've talked about that. You know, he, he's mentioned several parts of the body and the weakness of the body as you get older and what's happening. But, but it's that way with our overall strength. Uh, and to the point where you get to where you're not able to do hardly anything at all. That even a grasshopper, if you had to carry a grasshopper, now that, that might be a slight exaggeration, but that's the purpose of it, to show it. But carrying a grasshopper would be a burden to an aged person, and he wouldn't be able to do it. But the Revised Standard, their, their rendition of that is, the grasshopper drags itself along. And again, that, that's a picture of what it's like sometimes as you get older. Uh, as you get older, you can't move as fast as you once did. It, it, that in itself can be a burden sometimes, just trying to walk. Uh, you know, we may need help of, of walkers, of canes, and sometimes even a wheelchair to get around. But as you get older, it's harder to do that. And, and it's just like a grasshopper that doesn't move rapidly, just dragging along. And somebody even said that uh, even there's, there, there's a semblance sometimes between that grasshopper and the aged man. Uh, they've got thin legs and they're bloated. <laughs> That's kind of a cruel thing, I think, to say about them. But anyhow, you know, you're like that drag, that uh, grasshopper just drags itself along. You don't have the strength you used to have. And, you know, again, as you go through all this reading this, it's kind of discouraging to think about it. 
I told somebody that, and I always talked about, man, I hope to live to be 100. You know, I wanted to go. Of course, when I was talking about that, I was a teenager. And I had this foolish idea in my mind, when I get to be 100, I'm going to be just like I am now. I'm going to be able to do what I'm doing now, and, and it's just not going to be that way. And, and so it makes quite a bit of difference. And so it's like the grasshopper that drags itself along, and desire fails. The things that you used to like, the things that you used to do, uh, don't attract you anymore sometimes you get older. I, I've noticed it, it's true just in desires general. It may be in the food that you eat. Uh, I know one thing that really impressed uh, the doctors and impressed me about my father-in-law, he lived to be 93, he never lost his appetite. But so many people I know, as they've gotten older, just don't desire food like they used to. Uh, I can still get excited about eating, uh, especially when it's something I really like. But some people, you know, the things that they used to enjoy when they were younger, as they get older, they don't like that anymore. It doesn't appeal to them. And some of the activities they used to do, maybe, maybe a man loved going hunting or fishing, but as he's gotten older because his strength is failing, it's not as appealing to him. You know, he doesn't enjoy it as much. Uh, I can remember going deer hunting, uh, and a lot of times we'd go, it'd be raining outside and freezing cold. And I've never cared for that kind of weather, but I would go anyway. But you couldn't get me to do that today in that kind of weather. Uh, you know, you, just certain things, you lose your appeal for them. But in the Septuagint translation of this, it, instead of saying desire fails, it says capybara fails. I'm not familiar with capybara, that, that plant, but supposedly it was a sexual stimulant. And so the idea is that maybe what he's talking about here is as the man gets older, it's the sexual desire that fails. And, and even the stimulants that, that might be had are not sufficient uh, to give him back that desire. And, and so it's just something that, that happens. And whether it's talked about that specifically or just any normal desire that a person might have, uh, that as you get older, uh, that desire just seems to, to go away. And so desire fails because, he says, man goes to his eternal home. And so here's where he begins talking now about death. Man goes to his eternal home. Uh, what is that eternal home? Sir? Sir? It's what? It's in him? It, oh. <laughs> we told you, you know. <laughs> the doors of the street are shut. I know. Uh, well, you know, Brother Burton Kaufman, he believes that the eternal home, that this is, this is talking about heaven itself. That home that God has, has promised to people, uh, to those who are his children those who are obedient to him. Uh, I have some problems with that. Uh, and, and I love Burton Kaufman's commentaries, and I follow him quite a bit in that. But I think probably what he's talking about here when he talks about man goes to his eternal home, what would have been understood by most of the people back then at that age would be the grave, the Sheol. The, the, they would look at that. But Burton Kaufman said, well, no, that's not an eternal home. Uh, you know, but th that's got to be, but someone turned, and I started to look for my notes here to get this, uh, but in the book of uh, Second Timothy, I hope this is it, Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10. And that's right in the middle of the sentence. And uh, Paul being the way he is, he has a long sentence. So let's go back to verse 8 to get to the beginning of that sentence. Paul says to Timothy, Do not be ashamed then of testifying to our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel and the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not in virtue of our works, but in virtue of his own purpose 
and the grace which he gave us in Christ Jesus ages ago, and now has manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And so Paul says that, that Christ is the one who brought life and immortality to light. And so I think, you know, under the Old Testament, even back in the patriarchal age, I believe people had a, an idea, a hope, a longing for that. You know, Job said, if a man die, shall he live again? And that was a question a lot of people wondered and pondered about. And, and Job also pointed out there's hope for a tree, you know, if it falls, it might sprout again. Uh, and, and there have been, you know, a, a lot of people that would, ex you know, see things like that happen and begin to, well, what about man? If man is the, the height of God's creation, surely had, God has something in mind for him that he will live again. But they didn't have any real knowledge of it. Uh, they had that hope and desire. But when Christ came, he's the one that brought it to light. He's the one that gave us the clear knowledge and understanding that you and I will live forever and ever. But I don't know that Solomon, you know, understood that or had that knowledge from God given to him. But anyhow, that, that's the thing that it talks about there. Man goes to his eternal home, his death. And because in connection with that, then it says, and the mourners go about the streets. Now, when you talk about mourners, in, in those ancient days, and especially, I know, among the Jews, they had professional mourners. You know what a professional mourner is? Yeah. And, and, and to mourn, you know, and to wail. Uh, I've known some people who could go to a funeral of somebody they didn't know anything about. And you'd have thought that was their mother, father, or their wife, or their husband that died. The way they would carry on. Uh, there, there are some people who, who do that. But there were, back then, there were people that did that, you know, for, for a living, as it were. Uh, I would like somebody to turn to Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 17. Jeremiah 9 and verse 17. Who's got that? Okay, send for the mourning women to have them come. Now, what was the latter part of that you said? That's different from the Revised Standard. Okay, the Revised Standard says the wailing women. So, yeah, so you'd have the mourning women and the wailing You know, they're, they're calling them, come. You know, uh, we've got that situation where we need to be weeping and mourning, so let's get these women who are good at that to come and be there for it. Now, in, in, in Jesus' day, uh, you know, when Jesus was called to the home of uh, Jairus, whose daughter had passed away, and when Jesus got there, uh, he, he found people gathered there, the flute players and, and those who were wailing. And, and he told them to, to leave, sent them out of the room because he said, she's not dead, she's asleep. And they all laughed into scorn. But those may have been, you know, the professional uh, mourners that were there. And they were the ones carrying on. Now, here, when it talks about it, it says, the mourners go about the streets. Uh, and it may be what he's talking about here is, you know, uh, they're going about the streets prying their trade, uh, letting people know we're mourners. And, and here's somebody that they know about that's gotten old and, and, you know, been looking, he could die at any moment. And so hourly we've been, been keeping check on it to see if he's still alive. And so they're going about the streets uh, to check on him maybe uh, and, and, and letting people know that they're available. Uh, to weep and to mourn for that person whenever it comes. So the mourners go about the street. Man goes to his eternal home. Man dies. And the mourners go about the street. And here's something that, that's, that's true for every person. We know this is going to happen. That death is something that everyone has to undergo unless Christ returns first. But that's what we expect. And so the things that you're going to talk about from there on through verse 8 
is also going to be talking about death. And so he says, beginning then in verse 6, Before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. So look at verse 6. Before the silver cord is snapped. Now, all of this is, uh, I guess, a form of poetic language in describing death. But when it talks about the silver cord uh, and the golden bow, what, what is that talking about? Now, it was interesting to me reading this. Brother Burton Coffin pointed out that, you know, many years back, people had a particular idea as to what that silver cord and golden bow was referenced to. And, and today, people have a different idea about it. And so he said, what they used to think about, the silver cord, before the silver cord was broken, before it snapped, that they thought that was talking about the spinal nerve down your back, which even today we call it what? The spinal cord. And, and so, you know, just as all these things are talked about, the aging process, the outward part of a man that begins to fail as he gets older. But now when we talk about death, we're talking about the inward workings of man. And, and when that spinal cord snaps, you know, and, and the golden bowl is broken, well, if, if if that silver cord is talking about the spinal cord, what would you think that the golden bowl is talking about? The head, where the brain is, that controls our thoughts and our emotions and our actions. It controls the body. And so when these things happen, when that cord snaps, when that golden bowl is broken, and I really believe that's, to me, that's physically what, what I would consider in, in regarding whether or not a person is really dead. It's not just for me just when he stops breathing, or, but when he doesn't have any brain function. There are no brain waves. It, it, it's no longer operating. I believe that's when the, the spirit has left the body, and that's just an opinion. But, but anyhow, you know, any, either of those things are vital to the life of a person. And when that spinal cord is broken and the golden bowl, uh, if that's talking about your brain is gone, then that's when death occurs. Now, he likens it to other things, too, in the same uh, uh, sentence with it. Uh, he says, or the pitcher is broken at the fountain. Uh, now, I was not familiar with this, but uh, Brother Coffin said that in the Bible, uh, light is, is used in reference to life, and I can see verses on that, and that water also represents life. So the pitcher, uh, the pitcher is what you, you get water in. And uh, so when the pitcher breaks, the water's lost. And so that would symbolize uh, uh, life is gone. So whenever that pitcher breaks and, and life is gone, talking about the death of a person, uh, is broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. Now what do you think the wheel would be? Well, first of all, what's a cistern? Sir, where the water is stored, the water is stored. Uh, or it could be a well where, where it's coming up. But yeah, a cistern. You know, the Jews had those places that they built, dug out huge things in the cities for water that they could have, you know, uh, if, if they were ever under siege. But now it talks about the wheel breaking at the cistern. What would the wheel be? Yeah, what you draw the water up with. You know, uh, maybe have an old wooden bucket like you used to have, you know, in our country from years back uh, in, in a well. But over time, what happens to that wooden bucket? It begins to deteriorate. Maybe it begins to rot, and one day it just breaks, and it can't be repaired. And so, again, it would symbolize death. You know, that, that, that as you age, you get older and older, and this body is even weaker and weaker. And the time's going to come when it's just going to break as in, in the sense that it's, it's not going to function anymore. And life is gone from a person. So emphasizing over and over again there the idea of death coming. And when it comes, look at verse 7. And the dust returns to the earth 
as it was. Someone turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 2, and verse 7. We're going to look at that in, in another passage there in Genesis 2 about this. But Genesis 2 and verse 7. So man was created from what? From dust. Now, if you look at chapter 3 in Genesis in verse 19, uh, after man has sinned and God has gone through, you know, and he's uh, told what's going to happen as a result of their sin, uh, you know, as far as, you know, they're going to have to raise their crops from thorns and thistles. That's going to be harder work for them. Uh, The woman's going to have her pain and and birth uh, increased and multiplied. Uh, The serpent is punished because he's going to go along now, not going to be walking, but going along on his belly and eating the dust. And then, what about man? Verse 19. Chapter When God created man, he created him out of dust. And when man dies, he's going back to dust. And so that's what Solomon is talking about here. The dust returns to the earth as it was. But what about the spirit? It returns to God. Now again, that would give you some ideas about about man surviving death. At least the spirit does. Uh, The spirit is not going to die. Uh, It's going to return to God who gave it. Uh, Man is is a a dual being. uh, And he is both body and spirit. And the body goes back to the dust. But the poet said, you know, uh, about that, that's not true of the spirit. Uh, Dust to dust was not spoken of a soul. And so when death comes, and the Bible describes death as a separation of the spirit from the body, that body will go back to dust, but the spirit's going to go back to God. Now, as it talks about it here, it says, uh, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. God's the one that gave that spirit to us. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 9. We're studying the book of Hebrews on Sunday night, but we haven't gotten to verse 9 yet. Who's got that can read it for us? Hebrews 12, 9. Yes, sir. Okay, it talks about we've had fathers of the flesh, uh, of our physical body. But then he talks about the father of our spirit. That's talking about God. God's the one who created our spirit. God's the one that gave that spirit uh, into the body to bring life to it. And so when I die, yeah, the body, the physical body dies. It's going back to dust. But my spirit's going to go back to God. Now, what does it mean to go back to God? Going back to God who gave it. Is everybody saved? Yeah, we're, we're going back into the control of God. Now, when we go back to control of God, uh, He's going to put us in one of two places, either in paradise or in uh, Tartarus, a place of torment, to await the judgment. Uh, and so, God's still in control. And he's going to take that control at death for our spirits. It goes back into the control of God. He has power over it to determine what's going to happen. Uh, And the result of that is that we will be there to to stand in judgment when the day of judgment comes. Now, the New Testament again gives us a lot more uh, knowledge and understanding about that. Uh, The Jews talked about judgment. A lot of times when they talked about judgment of God, they talked about 
a physical judgment here, maybe, you know, God destroying a city or God causing a, a famine to come upon the land or something like that as punishment for their sins. But here we're talking about the eternal judgment of God. And in the New Testament, there's several things about it. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 uh, tells us what about judgment. God has done what in regard to judgment? Okay. So death and judgment. Judgment is an appointment that God has made for us. He's appointed a day uh, in which we're going to stand before Him in judgment. So we know it's, it's a day appointed by God that we'll stand before Him in judgment. But not only is it is a day of appointment that God has made for us, but other things too. Uh, it's going to be a time for all people. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, Paul said, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ uh, and give an account for what we've done, whether it's good or evil. And so it's an appointed day, and it's an appointed day for all people. Every one of us will have to stand before God in judgment. Nobody will be able to escape that. Uh, on the day of judgment, Christ himself is going to be the judge for all of us. Uh, Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. Uh, God has appointed that day of judgment. But there, Luke writes about it and says that, that that day of judgment, God has appointed a man. But it's not just any man. He identifies that man by saying he's given assurance to all people and that he hath raised him from the dead. That's talking about Christ. And so God has risen Christ from the dead. And now when the judgment comes, he's the one that God's going to use to judge us. He'll be our judge at that time. And then also the New Testament tells us about it, that uh, the standard for that judgment. What's the standard that God has for judging us? His word. John chapter 12 and verse 48. Again, Jesus is the one talking about that. And Jesus says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words has one that judges him. For the words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last days. So that's the standard that God will have for us. <clears throat> so now, when you look here at, at, at what all he's going to be talking about, he's going to come to that conclusion uh, about uh, we need to remember God in the days of our youth. He's talked about that. And the reason why is because there's that time of judgment coming that we'll have to stand before God to give an account to Him. And then he ends it here in verse 8, this section with the words, Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. <clears throat> you know, I mentioned uh, Brother Coffin was one that believed that beginning in, in chapter 9, but especially in chapters 10, 11, and 12, you have a, a change. You see a change here in, in Solomon's life. Uh, it's different from what you have in those first 8 to 9 chapters of the book. Uh, and, and over and over in those chapters, you're talking about vanity of vanities. All is vanity. So why here now would he be talking about that? <clears throat> uh, Brother Kaufman believed that and among others who had said this, he believed that this was kind of a signature. You know, just like you might sign something to show that you've written it. Uh, some people say, well, there's such a difference between what the writer is saying here than what he said before. They said, they believe that somebody else wrote that, not Solomon. But Brother Cobb said, this kind of is like Solomon signing it. When he says, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Everybody identifies that with Solomon. That's what he said over and over again in the first part of this book. He's emphasized, so he's saying it again. But also I think for that, that <clears throat> he's come to that point where he realizes that a life without God, even today, is a life that is vain, that's lived in vain. It's worthless if you live your life without God. And, and that's what he's talking about. That's what he's encouraging people. Remember the Creator in the days of your youth, he says. And again, the day's coming when you'll have to stand before God in judgment. 
And if you've lived your life without God, then all of your life is going to be vain. Everything about it is going to be vanity. And so vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Says the preacher, all is vanity. Well, <clears throat> again, that would identify more with Solomon. Now, the last part, uh, verses 9 and 10, uh, gives really kind of a statement uh, for why Solomon is writing this book. And he makes the statement here, he says, Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find pleasing words, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. Uh, now some people believe that Solomon didn't write this because Look, he says, he doesn't say, besides being wise, I also taught. He says, the preacher also taught. So he speaks of himself in the third person. Uh, I believe that's what he's doing here, that this is Solomon, and that's why he's doing it. But others believe, no, that, that can't be Solomon. But again, uh, some of the things he's going to say here identify as being Solomon. But look what he says about it. Besides being wise, now that Solomon had greater wisdom than any man, uh, that lived on the earth in his day, blessed by God with that wisdom. But besides being wise, it says the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging Proverbs with great care. Who wrote the book of Proverbs? Most of it anyway. Solomon. But now, it, it's just more than, than, than the book of Proverbs. Someone turn over... Uh, I think I put this down, I hope I did, from the book of, uh, let's see, oh, it's in my footnote here, 1 Kings 4, 32, that's one of the footnotes I had in this Bible, is that, so I want to look at 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 32. Doesn't it say about, did I give the wrong one? All right, read the next verse and see, maybe. Let me. Yes, sir. Okay. There are not that many Proverbs in the book of Proverbs. But it says that he wrote 3,000 or spoke 3,000 Proverbs. And 105 songs. Uh, and it talks there in, in the verse 4, the verse 30, about the wisdom that he had. And so the writer here of the book of Ecclesiastes says, besides being wise, he also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying, and arranging proverbs. Solomon did a great deal of teaching in his life in these proverbs that he wrote and used to teach people. But notice in, in doing it, he says, weighing and studying and arranging proverbs with great care. Uh, Solomon was a scholar, and, and people needed to understand that he's a man who was well qualified to be a teacher to instruct people in these things, and why that fits with the writer here of this book, because he's is that. Uh, he's done it with great care, and the preacher sought to find pleasing words. Now, what would that suggest in his writing? You ever picked up a book and just started reading it and didn't take you long before you were bored to death and set it down? How many of you ever read Moby Dick? Whew. It's like reading a biology book. He spends so much time talking about all and I, you know, I never could, I kept, come on, I'm going with the whale chase, you know. The movie was a lot better because <clears throat> it didn't deal with all that. Well, when Solomon wrote, he wrote with pleasing words. He, he wrote in such a way that people would be interested in it, could be pleased by it, knowing, you know, uh, that they're being instructed, they're learning something also from that. And notice that it says he wrote it with pleasing words and uprightly. I mean, Solomon was careful. When he wrote, he wrote with integrity. He wanted to make sure that what he was writing was the truth, 
that he's writing without any bias at all in regard to this. You know, uh, it, it's hard for us <clears throat> in our teachings today to avoid bias uh, because we have our belief, our side, what we believe about things, and uh, we don't want to give that up, and, and we're not going to offer what other people believe about that that might be just as true as what we believe. Uh, Solomon's not like that. He used integrity in writing. No bias, but to be careful to write, he said, words of truth. And, and whether or not, <clears throat> you know, what he says later maybe shows that what he had believed before was wrong and what he was doing was wrong. But he's not interested in trying to protect himself. He's interested only in the truth. And so his integrity will not allow him to do anything except present the truth. And that's what he's doing. And that's why he's qualified to give instruction to people. And why he's qualified to write this book and for us to be able to read it and learn from it. Then verse 11, and just have time to mention this. He says, the sayings of the wise are like goads and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings which are given by one shepherd. Uh, we don't have time to talk about all of that. We'll finish this book up next week, hopefully. But what is a goad? What? A prod. Usually, you know, you take a stick and sharpen it. And what do you do with a prod? Yeah. You prod people with it. Well, well you, they used it for animals, of course, you know, to get animals to move. Uh, it's important, but you remember when Saul of <clears throat> Tarsus uh, was on the road to Damascus and, and Christ appeared to him? And one of the things that Jesus said to him was, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. There was a prodding that Saul was being given, uh, but he wasn't willing to accept it, and, and he kicked against it. Well, you know, if someone's prodding you and you kick back against it, you're just making it twice as bad. Uh, you're, you're giving greater force to it. And so, so it's hard to do. And so he's not doing what he needs to do, and he kicks against it. Uh, but he's saying to us here, the words of the wise are like goads. Uh, they, they have a way of prodding us, of getting us to do what needs to be done. And there's several other things. We'll talk about that finish that up very quickly next week and uh, I had one book suggested to me that I'd like to study and that was the book of Esther uh, and uh, if nobody has anything better that they want to study or would like to study uh, I'll start preparing for Esther uh, after this uh, it's not a very long book but uh, have something else in mind to think about after that because we're trying to stay in the Old Testament on Wednesday nights but uh, let's close out with a word of prayer then we'll be dismissed Father once more we're grateful and thankful for all that you do for us in life so thankful for the Bible that you've given to us and for the hope that we have Father in studying that word to know your will and what we need to do and help us Father to be wise to allow your word to be a goad to prod us and get us going in the right direction to do what we need to do and the way we need to do it, that our lives might count, Father, for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.